if we get shipping to represent the impact that it has on society, then we might start to think about shipping less and do things in a different way. This is Beyond the Box, integrated logistics from the inside out. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Box, coming to you from the World Maritime Forum in Copenhagen. I'm Ellen Hoffman. Among the important topics being discussed here is the road to zero carbon emissions for maritime shipping. As you'll know from previous episodes of the podcast, maritime shipping is responsible for 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, revised its greenhouse gas strategy and set a new target for the industry to reach net zero emissions by or around 2050. So where are we on that journey to zero? What are the challenges and what might be ahead in future? To unpack this, I'm joined by Pranile Delgard, Chief Officer of Government Business and Analytics at the Mask McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, Oystein Jensen, Chief Sustainability Officer with Oitfell, and Gareth Price, Head of Decarbonization for Switzer. Thank you all for being here. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Pranile, perhaps we can start with you. What will it take for us to get to zero? A huge, huge collaboration. We need to bring the full ecosystem together to find solutions to those systemic inefficiencies that we have in the industry. But you could say very briefly, we need to focus on the energy demand from the fleet. We can reduce that with existing technology quite effectively, at least by some 15%. We also need to look at the, or accelerate the production of green fuels. That needs to be scaled big time. And then we need to find transitionary business models that can solve the problem that shipping is global, it's international. And sometimes you will have that the willingness to pay is not exactly where the green transportation is sitting. So how do you connect the physical world with the aspirations? And finally, to drive all that, we need a very solid international regulation. So we ensure that we get the right speed and the right acceleration. Right. So maybe we'll start on the green fuels. It's actually something that we talked about in episode five of the podcast. Gareth, I can go to you because fuels with lower emissions are obviously a very important part of this puzzle. How do we get to that point where we can ensure that supply meets demand? I think it's probably one of the primary challenges we face. So Switzer, the organization that I work in, last year we had 68 tugboats running on HVO. And, and we really pushed that model to make it happen. In the market we were in, UK, HVO was available and we could use it. It comes at quite a high cost premium. But what we found when we looked across our wider organization into markets like EMEA and uh, Australia and places like this, then the availability of those drop-in fuels, which are crucial for making immediate change, they're just not there. We hear lots of offers for fuels, but actually when you get down to it and say, hey, I want to buy a blend B30 or B20 or B50 or whatever, then all of a sudden it's not quite there and there's just a bit of work to do here and just a bit of work to that. So I think transparency is certainly key about what can be offered, where you can get it, and then limitations around using it. And in the background, when we start looking at future fuels, then you start to see even more challenges because the technology isn't necessarily there to utilize the fuel the way you want. For our vessels where they're smaller, we don't have engines to use methanol. Ammonia is very difficult because of the toxicity issues around that. Not impossible, but it's going to take a long time to get there. I think really the key there is transparency across the supply chain, all the actors that need to come into play to make a fuel work and then find solutions that you can accelerate because the timelines from our perspective are really slow to be able to start accessing future fuels where we can see the price metric coming down faster. So collaboration and transparency and then ultimately uh, a commitment to work together to solve the issues. And so the energy efficiency of vessels also comes into this. Oystein, can you tell us how far have we come on this front and how far do we still have to go? I think that there are uh, multiple answers to that question. And uh, 
what we have done in Oddfjell. We have been focusing on energy efficiency for a long period of time. To be honest, it was not something that we did because of a uh, emission and environmental perspective. It was from a pure financial perspective because we wanted to spend less money on fuel, uh, make our ships more energy efficient. Uh, that was initially the drivers for all the things that we did. So we looked at this from an operational perspective, a technical perspective. We did some uh, investments, quite massive investments. Uh, we updated the propeller routers, uh, technical up upgrades and retrofits that we did on existing vessels. And it had tremendous results. So one of the projects actually improved energy efficiency with uh, 20%. And we've continued doing that. And we measure ourselves on this all, all the time. So we actually now report in parallel with our financial reporting. In all our quarter reporting, we report on, on carbon intensity of, of the fleet. And if we compare to what would be the 2008 IMO benchmark, which is the benchmark for the CII, uh, we have been reducing our carbon intensity with uh, 52%, which is a lot. And that's why we're also kind of surprised that a lot of other companies don't take all these actions because they are there. Uh, and I think it will be a long time before we get a new fuel available. Uh, and there's still a lot of things that, that can be done. We're now retrofitting also our uh, some of our ships with sails in order to further improve carbon intensity. Wow, that's uh, really interesting. Pranile, what would you like to add to this? No, I, was, I was just thinking that it's fantastic to hear all the initiatives you do, and, and it's exactly what you would, as an economist, think that's the right thing to do. But just adding to your question, I think we need to look at the broader picture. Um, if we look at the global fleet, there's an immense potential. There's a lot of available technology out there. We can save 15% of what we're spending right now, but it's not being obtained at all at the speed that it should. There's also more complexity in terms of who owns or who operates. Um, but it's it's just important that we recognize those first movers and we also recognize that the tail end is really, really big. And there's an enormous potential that we need to address. Yeah, I think vessel efficiency really can be like the unsung hero here as well, because the other dimension is that as you transition to future fuels like methyl and ammonia or battery power, you don't have the same energy density as you get with fossil fuel. So for methanol, it's about 2.3 times more methanol to deliver against one unit of diesel in our case. So saving on fuel, being more efficient, means it's easier to transition to those future fuels because you're going to need more space on board to match the amount of fuel on board. So by cutting your consumption rate, then you save cost in the short term, but also it prepares you better to work with these fuels that have lower energy densities going forward. When I travel around and meet people, I, the, the question I get the most, what, what's your take on the future fuel? I, I think that that is uh, a big question uh, and a lot of ship owners and, and companies get that question. And I think that the, the, kind of, the good intention becomes also an enemy because you don't really know the answer to that. And instead of, of doing what you can do today with things that you have available, you're waiting for this fantastic solution that's going to solve your problems. That will not happen. You need to do whatever you can today. It will take a long time before we are able to get a zero fuel available at scale. But all these solutions that are there, it, it's on the table. And the, the benefit of it is that it's it, uh, it, from a financial perspective, it makes sense as well because you reduce the amount of fuel that you're using as well. So energy efficiency is the really way to go in the short term. Renila, you mentioned regulations. What more would you like to see on the regulations front? Oh, a lot. <laughs> so first of all, we, we operate with what we call the short-term measures, which is very much about, Oystein mentioned the CII, the energy efficiencies, accelerating that uptake. The, those are, are the immediately available opportunities. Then we're talking about the midterm measures, uh, where we both need uh, to have technical agreement on global fuel standards. What does green fuel look like? because that might depend a lot on, on who you're talking to. And the second part that we would like to see is a carbon levy. Uh, we firmly believe that coming with a big stick, uh, well, it's not only coming with a big stick, it's, it's also a matter of closing the gap between, you could say, the artificially subsidized heavy fuel or, or fossil fuel and the green fuel. So putting in a carbon levy that ensures that the competitiveness with heavy fuel as being evened out. And then ideally, we would like to see some of, it, of the proceeds from such a carbon levy to be recirculated into the industry in order to ensure a just and equitable uh, transition. And I wouldn't go as far as saying that not some of the uh, revenues for that. I think that all of the revenues should go back in a truly circular system. 
And I think that uh, by doing that, the shipping industry can solve these problems. If we have a, a levy or a tax, and now listen carefully, you hear hearing a ship owner calling for taxes. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that that is possible. As uh, Pernille says, you, you need to even out the differences. You are able to use this in a closed system. You can have a levy on the top or a tax uh, to incentivize the use of alternative fuel, and you can use the, the revenues from that to developing countries. You can just subsidize green corridors, etc. And, and that will not happen by itself. You need to have regulation in order to do that. We see also that uh, this regulation happens in the EU, where the, yeah, the regulation is even sharper. We have the emission trading scheme coming in Europe. That is also essential that this uh, ETS system, it drives behavior and not uh, just a tax. Because uh, it's not fully clear whether all these revenues will they will go back to energy the, or, or to shipping and green transition. A lot of this will actually fuel the European e economy. And I think that that will be uh, difficult uh, to take that away if we got a global system. Another element is that the, the real tool for the EU in order to achieve the, the 2040 targets now is the allowances. They will not be issued any new allowances after 2039. And that means that with the current policies in place, we're out of allowances. You cannot go and buy allowances to, to go and emit CO2 in the EU after 2040, unless there's changes to the policies uh, in the current picture. So that is going to really, really drive the transition in Europe. And, and of course, there's also a concern that you lose competitiveness of Europe compared to other countries. So it cannot continue to have a, to be in disfavor of, of being in Europe. But uh, there's certainly a need uh, of, uh, of regulation to drive this because it will not happen by itself. Mm, Gareth, you share this view? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that this is where the IMO can play a really crucial role so that they can balance these different regulatory regimes. So if you're on that level playing field between one region and another, you really do need that sort of guiding hand to actually maybe pick and choose the best of uh, all worlds if it's possible to get that alignment. I think it's fair to say most companies are reticent to actually promote for new regulation because it's generally seen as a negative thing. So I think these things have to be quite carefully framed that they are enabling regulations that are helping to drive a transition so that if you are taking that strong front runner position, that that doesn't penalize your business. Because at the end of the day, we're all here for a sustainable agenda, but that also means sustainable business. So we can't keep financing all these initiatives on our own if customers aren't willing to pay. So the regulatory environment needs to support those companies that want to make the changes that the policymakers want to achieve with their own targets at a country or a, or a regional level to actually enable business to do the heavy lifting in terms of driving through the difference. Pernille, the Melsk McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping has actually highlighted the importance of supporting first movers and fast followers. What would that look like? We operate with a concept uh, that was initiated at um, the COP26 in Glasgow uh, by the Clyde Bank Declaration, uh, the Green Corridors, where we are trying to, you could say, make a, a micro model of the world. And instead of, of moving from an entirely black to an entirely green global shipping environment, you make a little closed environment that could be from Chile to Japan, where you say in that particular corridor, we put in place the, the port infrastructure, we put in place the fuel, uh, the green fuel production, we put in place the government permitting, the financing structure, the vessels, everything. So that will be a, a demonstrator of how could the whole world look like. If you're making, say, a number of these first mover projects, then you can always expand. So, so imagine you have Chile, Japan. It's going to be a smaller thing than to extend that to Chile, Singapore. And then you also have Japan, Singapore. And, and then you can slowly accelerate that transition. So it's really about saying, instead of solving the big problem in one go, which is essentially impossible, why don't we chop it up to smaller chunks and demonstrate how can we do it on a small scale also learning from that and say, for instance, on the regulatory perspective, the splitting the financing, you talked about the, we need the, the customer to pay and obviously the customer has to pay a part of it, but, but there's big, big bill that has to be split somewhere. Um, and having, finding that right balance where it's a matter of, of subsidies, it's a matter of increased prices maybe for the customers, but it's also a matter of having other parties cover their part of the bill and, and having a, a real life example simply allows you to see where where do we have the big challenges uh, and what could the solution be for that. 
Yeah, and uh, coming from Norway, we have had the, actually had the, one of the f- earliest and first successful green corridors. Uh, as you know, Norway is a lot of fjords, and in order to cross that, you would need a ferry. Some years back, the government did a quite bold decision, and as they're saying that, okay, in order to get a license to operate a ferry to cross this fjord, you will need to do that uh, with zero carbon. It has to be electrical. The electrical ferries was not on the market at that time. So the government said that they would subsidize that. They would start developing the market. And that's a kind of a mini green corridor. And what's happening now is that almost all ferries, at least all new ferries, are electrical in Norway. And the market has been developed. And there's no longer this kind of level of subsidization because now an effective market. Uh, the, the technology is there, the technology developed. They see that something is going to pay for that. So, so I think that the, the, the green corridor is a very good example of that. And, and if we are able to use, for example, the revenues from the ETS to promote and subsidize a green corridor, to demonstrate that this is actually working, and then we can develop the market, develop the infrastructure, see that it's possible. Uh, going back to my initial point about the, that closed loop of revenues, um, it needs to be there uh, to, to kind of stimulate and make the system go by itself going forward. So, so I think that the green green corridor initiatives are really positive because I think shipping has become a victim of its own success, right? The value of shipping on the service it provides to uh, the economy that we have today, we've got so efficient in this sector that it's become so low a cost that it's taken for granted. And, and I think that's a crucial thing is that we need to start that and start reflecting on, well, what is the fair price to pay to take on these new initiatives, which come at a much higher cost than we're used to spending? Because we've got like 100 years of efficiency in, in shipping and working with fossil fuels that we've got to replicate now with the green fuel solution. So I think that the green corridor stuff allows you to have a different conversation with all of the stakeholders in that environment to look at those models about what value do you bring to the table? What benefit can you do for the green agenda? And how do we allocate those costs and, the, and recognize the value to the customer equitably so we can actually drive the change where everybody benefits rather than single actors through the chain having to carry the higher or lower costs as it may be. Shipping has become way too effective from a financial perspective, but because we don't incorporate the environmental aspect, we're doing things that are not good for the environment. And and that comes back to also the carbon levy. If we get the price right, I guess that's a different way of saying what you say, yeah. that we need to evaluate what the value that shipping is bringing Right now, we are shipping goods around the world to process it, to ship it back again. That's really, from a climate perspective, a rather stupid thing. If we get shipping to represent the impact that it has on society, then we might start to think about shipping less and do things in a different way. Of course, that's not necessarily great for the shipping companies, but from a a world perspective, that might be the right thing. So it requires a significant rethink. It requires a a significant rethink, but a rethink that is supported by, by some regulation, because if it, I mean, today, economically, it makes sense to take your cashew nuts from West Africa, ship them to China to be roasted and ship them back to Europe to be eaten. Everybody can see from that example that that's nonsense, but we do it because economically it works. If we added the the environmental impact to it, it wouldn't work anymore. So, so there's a matter of, of driving that. Aware, well, not only awareness, but, but actually make it available to people that know this is not the right thing to do. We should do it different. Gareth, does that seem viable to you? Uh, I think it requires quite a lot of wider discussion outside our own industry, because what you're touching on is a fundamental change in the way that we look at uh, economic models. So forever, uh, the, the, the environment as a resource has just been seen as an externality outside of the traditional economic model. So you really need to rethink that in terms of pricing in the resource that is the environment, which historically is just seen as a linear way. It'll never run out. We've always got enough resource, whether that's oil or metals or whatever else. We need to really change the thinking around that. And I think pricing in the cost of abatement for carbon and things like that is beginning to bring nature into the economic model uh, in a soft way that helps us to move the discussion forward without getting into really more complex, deeper economic discussions because that's a massive topic in its own right. I, I fully agree that. And we think of some of those cost elements as a, as a pass-through cost in the end. That cost need to come to, to the end consumer that will drive behavior. Uh, but in order to do that also, I think that we ha- have still a long way to go to focus on, on scope three emissions mm-hmm. to really understand uh, what's, what's your kind of your total footprint. For us who operates in a kind of business to business area, it's a little bit different than if you're transporting goods for Ikea, because then you have 
uh, customers that are more cautious about the footprint of the product that they buy. So, so I think that there's a, there's a strong movement there. Uh, if you buy an electrical car today, the, the customers of that electrical car uh, is is more interested in the kind of total footprint of where this car is coming from and the total footprint of that uh, compared to if you are a kind of a oil major buying a uh, we are transporting a chemical from a cabin between chemical producers. So, so I think it's a it's a positive uh, development in in that area where we will see more and more informed uh, customers. The topic of scope three emissions and tracking scope three emissions is is really interesting. And I think for many businesses, it is quite challenging. Uh, globally, how how are businesses doing on that front? On the scope three reporting, um, let's say that that's a, an, an a fantastic opportunity for improvement. Uh, we have global partners across the entire maritime ecosystem um, where we're also discussing how do they deal with their scope three and, and whereas you said just five years ago, decarbonization was a bit of a new topic. Now everybody has a position and an opinion about their scope one and two. I think scope three is very much coming into the picture, but exactly as you say, it is a very difficult part to deal with. I think the, the, the right approach that fortunately many partners uh, do take and, and also other companies is to say, let's get started. We're not going to get it right in the first place, but at least starting to, to, to identify what does the scope three consist of? How do we measure it? How can, you can't manage it on, unless you start to measure, right? So, so there's, a, there's a whole learning process that we as a global community need to, to go through to understand how do you handle scope three. Um, and I think I'm, I'm actually quite positive if I look at what has happened over the last five years in terms of understanding awareness um, taking serious professional opinions and initiatives to address scope one and two. If we can continue on that same trajectory for scope three, I think we, we will push the world in, in a good direction. But it is a challenging uh, area and, and there's there's a whole transparency element that Garrett's called, talked about before. There's the data quality uh, challenge. It's easy to come up with something. I think we sometimes in Europe, we, we have this idea that if, if we get a report from a supplier, it, it's all good. Uh, when you work in different parts of the world, there's a data quality issue, uh, to say it in a polite way. For me, the scope three stuff from the procurement side of things, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges going forward. What I would say is that actually the need to act now, from our spe- perspective, if you focus on scope one, and scope two. When you take that CO2 level down, that's a net benefit from a scope three perspective to the company that you supply your service to. So starting now will actually help you as a business to be able to respond more quickly when your customers change and want to know about scope three. So these things all go hand in hand when you start to take a step back and look at the total supply chain about where you can actually be effective in supporting that value proposition up and down the supply chain. 100% agree. But I also think that uh, to bring it back to the alternative fuel discussion, because when you're looking at kind of scope three on the fuel, we need to, uh, as an industry, we need to understand uh, and not look at it very isolated because it's easy for us. I can bring on board a zero fuel from the tank until the wake. And I'm, I can be happy. I can be good. I can report zero. But if the development or production of that test fuel has actually increased compared to the alternative. So from a well to tank perspective, then we have uh, then we have gone the wrong way. So so I think that just the, the scope three thinking, the value chain thinking or the well to weight thinking is also essential. Before we wrap up, maybe we can have a line from each of you explaining why zero getting to zero matters. Well, I think if we don't do it, uh, there would be very many places on the earth that would be not very nice to be at. So I wouldn't say that it's for us to survive. I think we will survive. But if we want to have a pleasant place to live, we need to do something to the climate. Totally agree with that. It's clear the climate change and the impacts that we're having as a society are, are massively damaging and affecting communities globally. And we, as companies, we should take our share of the responsibility of helping to support that. But I also think that increasingly it's showing up as a clear business risk that if you don't do something to pair now, we're not going to be able to respond in the future when it becomes a much more acute issue through a regulatory structure or whatever. 
So we've touched on the fact that things take a while in the ma uh, maritime industry to come to maturity to the point where they're cost effective and you can trust and it doesn't affect your operation. We need to start taking those steps now to mature the technologies we need, be able to really deliver on the goals that are going to be necessary to attack the climate change issue. We also see this uh, uh, on the flip side of that, the opportunity side. Of course, we need to do something from a climate risk perspective, from a society perspective, from a business perspective. But we also see that it can come also with tremendous opportunities. So if we are able to solve these difficult questions and able to, to find that technology and scale it up to a, a possible scale, it will also give tremendous business opportunities for us going forward. So, so I think uh, both from a risk and opportunity perspective, it's, uh, it's essential to do that. That's it for this episode of Beyond the Box. For more discussions and insights on global trade and logistics, subscribe to Beyond the Box on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Until next time.